Hello everyone, welcome back to my Galileo 6.4x series in Kerbal Space Program 1.2.2 and in this episode we begin right away with a mission to Iota, Gale's closest moon and the goal here is to impact that moon and the contract is Luna 2, we've got the historical progression pack and as we see the boosters separate here uh, that pack has the real life missions in chronological order and so we're on Luna 2 which did impact the moon and it was the first probe to impact a body other than the Earth, so a uh, very important mission. Uh, but unfortunately this particular launch did not go so well. The trajectory was off and uh, probably I was just chatting away with people. So we, we ended up uh, bringing it back down again. And I tried to recover it using the engine on that stage because the scientific instruments are really really expensive and so the probe is very expensive. Uh, and surprisingly, since it was a vacuum engine, it does have a pretty good specific impulse at sea level, but that wasn't good enough, unfortunately. Uh, we ended up just with the probe core and and some antennae. That was all that survived. So, launched again, this time paying attention instead of chatting with people in the Twitch livestream. Careful with the trajectory this time. Thankfully, we do still have a very good budget, so we can just brush off the failures at this point until we start launching really expensive modules and rockets larger than a diameter of 1.5 meters, which is what we're limited to right now. We haven't even got 2.5 meter rockets yet. So on we go. This time you can see uh, that separation happened much higher, 130 kilometers, and this one uh, coasting along, and now we move on to the final orbital stage engine. Very quiet one. And here we are reaching orbit. And that's that for that part, but now we have to transfer all the way out to IOTA and that costs about 2600 meters per second. And this little stage has quite a lot of fuel. The nose cone also has fuel by the way. So just trying to get that correct. And just for comparison, transferring to Earth's moon in real solar system or in real life costs about 3,100 to 3,200. So about, let's say, 20% more. Here we are in IOTA's sphere of influence and transmitting some magnetometer science. And that is IOTA. And we are going to try and smack right into it. That is the plan. But of course we do try and get as much science as possible along the way. We naturally ensured that the impact point would be on the side facing Gale, otherwise we wouldn't be able to transmit information back. So let's perform all science there. Uh, Mystery Goo gives us only a little bit, and this is space near Iota now. But apparently we've already done the temperature scan, so nothing new there. And nothing new on the atmospheric pressure scan. The magnetometer isn't covered by the uh, perform all science thing, so I have to do that separately. Alright, so here we go, the last few moments uh, for our Luna 2 probe. I call it something else, but it's fulfilling the Luna 2 contract anyway. So here we go, fairly simple contract, and no new science. There we go. Alright, so, next! Well, let's take a look at the contract screen. We don't have any existing contracts here, so I pick up, well, Luna 3, which seems to be the next logical thing. And this one wants us to get some signs from uh, the sphere of influence of Iota and then return to the sphere of influence of Gale, so exit out of the sphere of influence of Iota. And that's unlike Luna 1. Luna 1 actually passed uh, by into the sphere of influence of Iota and then went out into interplanetary space. This time we have to return into Gale space. Okay, boosters off. And everything looks good, no flippiness. Now to make the contract worthwhile from a science standpoint, you'll note that I put a science junior on the probe instead of the goo experiment, which we've already done. So at least we'll be doing some new science on the way. And here we go, on to the final stage, which completes orbit, and then transfers to IOTA. So, th this is pretty good in terms of disposing stages. Some of the boosters, of course, get recovered. The first stage, I believe, gets recovered by stage recovery. 
but then at least everything else goes into the atmosphere and won't clutter up space. We don't have too much stuff floating around in Gale space right now, so that's good. So plotting for Iota here. And transferring. Of course, Gale has a second moon, Seti, which is actually larger than Iota, reverse of the of the pattern for Kerbin, and that will be another interesting challenge that we will move on to once we get the contracts for it. So here we go, Iota space again, and uh, we need to get some science. Fairly straightforward, and we just need to get the science junior done and then transmit that. So here we go. Observe Materials Bay. Uh, not as much science as I'd like, but any little, every little bit counts. And here we are back in space around Gale, and the contract is complete. So Luna 3 done. Let's go back to the Space Center. Armed with our new science, I decided to take a look at the tech tree, and Advanced Rocketry was definitely on my mind because it has a Terrier engine, and it's wonderful ISP. Uh, also a lot of other engines, as you can see, but uh, yep, definitely the Terrier, so I spend my 45 science on that. And then turn to other contracts, I see Discoverer 13, which is simply recovering something from orbit, and I take that contract as the next one up. Now, previously I had tried a mission called Discoverer 1, which was basically trying to do Discoverer 13, but we ended up not making orbit and uh, splashing down short of orbit instead, so we recovered something from suborbital flight. But I replaced one of the engines on that rocket with the ter Terrier engine now, so it has better efficiency, and so hopefully we will solve the failure that we had before. You might notice that aside from the coloring, a lot of our rockets are basically laid out the same way and so the addition of the Terrier will basically improve all of those rockets and the performance and Delta V of all of those rockets. Now here I made a mistake, I should have lit that engine first, uh, earlier before the boosters ran out. The boosters had gimbling by the way, those particular SRVs had gimbling, uh, but we ended up doing a little bit of flip there because I didn't do that properly caught itself but lost some delta v there and velocity of course and so here we are and we are lower than we ought to be when we switch to the terrier the terrier doesn't have a whole lot of thrust weight ratio at this point and i was counting on it to deliver a lot of delta v and instead it's going to struggle here and we have to keep our nose up to make sure that we don't re-enter we're still going down here you'll note uh, our, our vertical speed is in some trouble um, can it catch itself? I believe so. We're not going that fast, fortunately, so we're not going to burn up immediately. Yep, here we are going up, but then we switch to these loud, tiny engines, which are not very efficient, actually. These radial engines are, are pretty inefficient. But uh, here we go, going up. And we do reach a uh, space apoapsis there, but that's the best we can do. Once again, suborbital, but basically because of that flip. And that was more of a staging error than a trajectory error. So yeah, gotta redo this one. We went all Discover, early Discoverer flights. Uh, this Discoverer launches were CIA launches. They were trying to take pictures of uh, the Soviet Union and then bring the capsule with the, with the photos back down. Actually, the capsule would have been caught by a helicopter, but uh, we're not doing that. Uh, but yeah, this is yet another early Discoverer flight before Discoverer 13, which is the first one that actually succeeded. That was 12 failures on their part. Uh, but anyway, at least we got the capsule in this case. But we didn't make orbit. So up we go again. And this time you'll note four boosters. <laughs> and that's because if we can get the rocket higher up, we avoid the flipping issue, right? Because the flipping is more in the lower part of the atmosphere, and here you can see our boosters are now separating at above 20 kilometers. Also, we had the engine lit already, so everything is much better. And when we separate that, we are already in space now, and we turn to the Terrier engine, so it's at its maximum possible ISP and efficiency, and there's definitely going to be no problems here as far as getting into orbit is concerned. Yep. Here we go, that's the end of that stage, and now we've got these loud ones. Still haven't gotten to orbit yet, the Terrier with all of its Delta V uh, still wasn't enough all on its own. Uh, 
uh, I will look forward to unlocking 2.5 meter parts once we can. Uh, here we go. We are done. Of course, we have to save fuel to deorbit, and that is what we have left. So here's the deorbit burn. Very good. Not too much delta V necessary for that. We've still got plenty of extra there. Well, I did add an extra pair of boosters, so yeah, we we are a little bit overpowered, but that saves us from the problem with the previous flight. Okay, so here we go. Reentry configuration. The two antennae are supposed to balance out the scientific instruments on the opposite side. I don't think they actually add mass either the scientific instruments or the antennae, but. Uh, or they just add the mass to the, the thing they're attached to, so it's all right. Those little antennae, the Sputnikish antennae, are really resilient, as you can see. Okay, parachutes out, and so we're good for recovery. In fact, we still have communication. Coming down at four meters per second. Very calming music in the background, and that's an odd thing. Okay. Yep. Contract done. All right, back to the contract screen, of course, because now we don't have any excellent contracts. And the next one up seems to be Murky Redstone 2, uh, which I I really didn't want to do, but all right. There's a suborbital launch with a, well, with a Kerbal named Ham the Chimp, uh, who is a tourist, because, you know, that, well, anyway, we've come to the conclusion that Kerbals named the Chimp are actually honored guests of some kind that they're, they're uh, uh, when they have the last name Kerman they're actually part of the space program but uh, those named the chimp are actually uh, they're, they're, they're obviously not uh, you know uh, primates of any kind uh, they are instead honored guests therefore tourists okay so it's just a suborbital flight nothing much to see here except we do want to return the chimp safely and, uh, yep, looking good so far. Definitely in space. And I'm reserving some extra fuel in the rocket to slow down once we come back down, just to make things safer. And here we go, descending. And that's the end of it, separation. And in fact, uh, that'll leave it so gentle that there won't even be flame effects. You can see, uh, we're actually already in the atmosphere once we separated that. 75 kilometers in descending, arming the parachutes, and yeah, there wasn't any flame effects coming down. 12 kilometers below the speed of sound here, and waiting for deployment of the parachute. So, I don't know if the contract pack is going to require us to do Alan Shepard's flight, which was Mercury Redstone 3, which is just another suborbital flight, this time with a Kerbal who can actually control the vessel. But, um, yeah, well, that's the nature of the historical progression pack as you go through it in order. So, glad to get the funds, easy flight, no big deal. Alright, and so with this view of uh, Ham coming back down, I'll say thank you for watching. I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did enjoy this video, please do press like. If you have any comments or suggestions, please leave them in the comment section below. And I'll see you next time.